Okay, I think we're about a minute after, so um, I'll be respectful of your time and uh, get started here. So uh, thank you everybody for sticking around, uh, not till quite the bitter end, but uh, till lunchtime at any rate. Um, tell you a little bit about me. Uh, I'm Gordon Half. I'm Cloud Evangelist at Red Hat, which is sort of a fancy way of saying that I do all kinds of different stuff related to cloud and pretty much everything that touches cloud at Red Hat, which is pretty much everything. Um, some various contact information for me there. I have a blog and I have Google Plus and Twitter and so forth. I've been at Red Hat about three years. And before that, I was an industry analyst for a long time, uh, covering server, clustering, virtualization, cloud, all that kind of stuff. And then before that, I was at Data General for many years. I uh, did some of the early NUMA Unix servers there and so forth. Um, I do have a new book out, so people ask good questions. I've got some copies up here, and for those, I don't have enough to go around, but if anybody else wants to give me your business card, I'll be happy to send you a free uh, electronic copy. Uh, I do believe these slides are going to be made available by a Linux Foundation, but in any case, I can, uh, I can mail them to you. I'm not going to spend as much time on the first part of this talk as I, as I probably would with a different audience, but I think just to make sure we're all on the same page and really kind of as a segue into the rest of this talk, um, I do want to spend a few minutes talking about and having us think about uh, kind of how we got to where we are with open source and, and really sort of the what we're really doing with open source, because, because I think that's essential to talking about some of the other things I'm going to be talking about in the rest of this talk. And by the way, this, I want, would like this to be very interactive, so if I've said something that you disagree with or that you really feel an urge to comment on or ask a question about, feel free to interrupt me. I um, retain the right to, um, I suggest taking it offline in more detail later, but very happy to make this interactive. So you're kind of storing back with BSD. Um, you know, that, as people know, probably everyone in this room knows, Rose at Berkeley uh, was in many ways something that was somewhat pragmatically done by Bill Joy and others, but nevertheless, it certainly had a connection to the free speech movement uh, at Berkeley. And this is a quote from John Gage, who would uh, later go on to have a career at Sun Microsystems. And basically he says the open source movement is a free speech movement. So it was really very much tied uh, from the beginning with something that went beyond just looking at source code. Of course, probably better known today is uh, what went on later at the Free Software Foundation where you know, Richard Stallman, uh, I think in a sense, may, may be codified and went beyond some of the early initial uh, open source efforts, which sort of happened um, with this connection to free speech, but without not necessarily a whole lot of kind of philosophical thinking about kind of a framework for what that connection would look like. And as again, as everybody in this room, I'm sure knows this idea of free, uh, of this being a matter of freedom, not free beer, no charge, that kind of thing. However, I think we, we well, we have in many cases, um, I think probably somewhat to the annoyance of, of some, probably beyond annoyance in the case of Free Software Foundation, have tended to equate this so idea of software freedom with open source and kind of, kind of said those two are kind of sort of the same thing. And I think it's understandable because if you kind of look at the history, um, and this is primarily the history um, from kind of the, the originally the Unix side of things, 
there, the open source was a very useful vehicle for providing many of those freedoms. Um, early Unix source code was widely shared. Picture on the right there is is a kind of a later a, a later sort of official version of this sharing in terms of Lyons commentary on Unix, which many of you are probably familiar with. Um, the other thing was that sharing source code was something that was practical. I mean, you know, maybe the wide world as a whole didn't really know much about FTP or email or any of those kind of things, but they existed in the academic environments at which this sharing was happening. And then finally, um, you had all this incompatible hardware, and Unix was written as a portable operating system in C, originally rather an innovation in that regard. Um, but you had all these different hardware architectures. So this portable operating system nonetheless had to be tweaked and recompiled, relinked, whatever, for each of these different hardware platforms. So having the source code be open was a useful, practical thing in order to have this freedom to run software across all these different platforms. But now we get the cloud. And at some level, this doesn't all necessarily carry over to the cloud. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit about licenses in the context of cloud. Uh, frankly, there have been sessions here uh, that you've gone into a little more detail on that particular topic, and I'm not a lawyer, and just going to spend a little time there, but I'm really going to focus on what some of the other aspects of openness that are very relevant in a cloud computing context. A uh, couple of caveats here, I'm covering a fair amount of ground, not going to go into a huge amount of depth in a single topic, my idea here is really more to give you perhaps some things to think about. Um, also, I'm deliberately sort of focusing uh, here on things that touch cloud computing in a relatively narrow sense. And there are other aspects of openness, you know, such as open access to scientific journals and so forth, that are also important things to think about. Uh, as society as we move forward, but I don't really uh, address those particular points here. Well, first of all, just very briefly about kind of distribution, the licensing sort of thing. There was actually a very good panel uh, here uh, earlier this morning about talking about um, the AGPL V3. How, how many of you here are familiar with the APL, AGPL? Okay, a few of you. Um, so basically, this is a variant on the GPL v3 license, the GPL uh, v2, of course, being used, being used for uh, Linux and many other things, and GPL v3 being used for uh, a number of newer projects. Uh, GPL v3 was released at the same time as the GPL, and essentially, you know, the way the copyleft provisions of the GPL work is they kick in when you actually distribute the code. And that, that distribution is defined in essentially a fairly traditional Unix kind of way having to do with, uh, with linking, essentially. Um, that doesn't apply if you're delivering software over the network. And a number of people kind of saw this as a, as a bug, essentially, or certainly a limitation uh, in that license. So the AGPL uh, v3 came out. Um, it hasn't been widely accepted. And in fact, you know, there was a fairly um, lively discussion at panel earlier that to a degree it's been used. It's been used predominantly in you know, what might be called nefarious ways, essentially as a way to really force an upsell to a proprietary license in a, in a dual licensing kind of a model. In any case, it really has not taken off. And in fact, if we look at kind of web services community, if you would, um, way modern applications are written, um, the way it 
things a lot of service providers are working in. There's really been a general trend towards permissive licensing. Uh, this is from a blog post that Donnie Burkhold with Red Monk did, uh, did recently that kind of shows it on a language by language basis, which is sort of interesting in its own right. I think Donnie's floating around the conference somewhere if you wanted to talk about this in more detail. Um, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this, but I just, I think I just kind of observed that this has probably come about uh, in large, my theory is, or one of my theories, is that open source has been a very successful development model, and having permissive licensing uh, makes it easier for different entities, particularly commercial entities, to collaborate with each other. Uh, whereas, I think copyleft at some level uh, grow, um, represents that this sort of belief that, that that the essentially the open open source needs to be protected in that you kind of need to force people to contribute. And I'm sure many folks in this conference would probably object to that exact characterization. But nonetheless, I, I would argue permissive licensing has come about in part because it essentially emphasizes collaboration over protecting open source from nefarious use. But what I think is one of the more uh, important aspects of openness that we really need to think about in a cloud computing context, so not just cloud, but uh, in cloud among other things, is really around the idea of community. Uh, and you know, I mean, because at one level, open source project, an open source project that doesn't have a community, doesn't have, that you know, kind of isn't widely used and contributed to, um, is it really that useful at the end of the day? And you really do need to uh, develop those communities. And of course, Linux has been hugely successful in this. Uh, this is some of the Linux Foundation numbers uh, from last year. I, I'm not, I don't think I've seen their numbers from this year yet. But again, lots of different people contributing uh, over time. And I, I think that's very clearly been one of the great successes of Linux. That it's, you know, really, everyone here knows um, that there has it really has been this wonderful development model for an operating system. Now, you know, let's go forward to the cloud world. Um, OpenStack, uh, Grizzly is the current version. Uh, big OpenStack Design Summit. Uh, go, it's been going on up in uh, Portland, Oregon this week. I'd actually be up there if I weren't down here. And again. Uh, lot of contributions. And in fact, uh, for those who may not know, OpenStack is essentially an infrastructure as a service. So the idea is that you can stand up essentially a service provider on your own premise. Um, you can stand up a service provider like Rackspace on your own premise. And it's really been interesting if you've looked at the dynamic of how this cloud computing space has been developing, because the I think a lot of folks are really looking at OpenStack right now as sort of the presumptive winner in this space. I use the air quotes because I really try to avoid getting into kind of this racehorse mentality of the trade press. Uh, I don't think it's that simple. But in any case, certainly OpenStack has gone from being nothing to being widely hailed as a very successful cloud computing project. And one of, there's one reason for that, and that is the strength of the OpenStack community. So again, my, my point here is that I think increasingly we need to think less about licensing and more about the community associated with the project. And I think, so what makes a community successful? And again, I think there have been community talks, at least one community talk here by people who are far more involved in details here than I am, but a lot of interacting things matter. And in fact, I talked to a number of our community people, I've done a couple of uh, podcasts with some of our OpenShift 
community folks over the last month or two. And you know, one of the things that you know, one of the things that strikes me is that you figure a company like Red Hat that's been doing this for you know forever would um, you know have this process that we follow. You go, you, pro, you know, step A, step B, step C, so forth. Poof, you have a community. Uh, you have a mod, a governance model, and so forth. But in reality, it's a lot more complicated than that, and you have a lot of different things that essentially interact with each other in creating a community. Um, go through a few of these in a little more detail. Um, we, we have a group at Red Hat called uh, uh, OSAS, Open Source and Standards, and I, I crib this from, from uh, one of our web pages here. That they got to look in their being sort of three different fundamental community models and you know, lots of variants within this, but kind of from a high level. And the top level is, I hope nothing dies here. Uh, the, the top level, or the first one, is sort of a walled garden. You know, this is the idea that a company has an open source project. Um, but it's under an open source license, but only their employees get to be committers. Um, it's, you know, this is very much driven, you know, almost as a traditional software project. You know, what do we need to do for our customers? Uh, and certainly one of the concerns here um, is what happens if the ownership changes. Um, you know, not to mention, you know, any companies by name, but one might begin with S, the other might begin with O. Uh, which has caused some issues, but you know, in in general, you know, you can argue, yeah, this is sort of open source and letter, but maybe not in spirit. Um, the second, which I think one could imagine, I think probably everybody here can imagine a particular project that very much aligns with sort of the benevolent dictator model, and you know, I suppose that might be a little bit of a loaded term, but it's certainly not meant to be a negative. In fact, you know, I've, I've had arguments with people who say that really, if you kind of have looked historically at the, at the successful open source projects, they tended to be sort of a benevolent dictator model, where I think it's important to note the dictator is essentially being given, um, given power by the by the community and the you know I, I think the concerns there over time is you know well what happens if the dictator becomes less benevolent or you know it gets it sort of gets out of it and, it, and there hasn't really been a succession plan uh, which often there isn't in kind of a community type of environment um, and then the third is and you know, I, I think meritocracy as a term sometimes gets a bad rap because I think it's sometimes deliberately misused. But the idea here is that you do have kind of a broader community, you have some sort of governance model. You know, Apache Software Foundation is sort of probably one of the classic examples of this. Um, one, one of the issues you run in here, and you know, certainly there's been some criticism around OpenStack in this regard, is you've got all these different entities and it's messy and they have to coordinate and so forth. Although I guess if you buy into open source, I'm not sure that's a terrible thing. So that's kind of some thinking around community. Uh, so, you know, getting kind of more into the bigger cloud picture, um, so, you know, if open source code isn't the be all to end all, um, you know, what are some of the other aspects of openness that matter? And I would argue that one of the most fundamental uh, points is around the portability of workloads from one place to another. So if you're running on one public cloud or if you're running on one private, uh, private cloud or virtualization platform implementation, um, can you move that to other places? Because you know the fundamental idea with with cloud, and I've very deliberately not gone into a bunch of definitional stuff here. But the bottom line there is that you're you're running your workload in one place, you won't be able to move it elsewhere. And this is probably particularly evident on 
in terms of public cloud providers, uh, but it also applies across different virtualization technologies and so forth. And you, and, you know, it, there's this sort of idea of hybrid IT, you know, Red Hat, we kind of call what we're doing in cloud, open hybrid cloud, but you know, pretty much all big analyst firms and so forth all pretty much agree that we are moving to this environment where you're going to be sourcing uh, services of various kinds and computing resources from a bunch of different places. And uh, some of those will be more reliable than others. Uh, some of them will go away. Some of them will change business practices, for example. So the basic idea is you really want to be able to move those workloads and that data uh, across those different environments. Um, you know, this is sort of one particular example um, you know, that we're doing with, um, with management called Cloud Forms. And the idea here is that you can have essentially define an application, but then deploy it in a number of different environments. Uh, so you kind of having, uh, having sort of this application and operating system environment defined by a template and having that be essentially a way to, to specify a portable application that can run on the different virtualization platforms, public clouds, and so forth. But I think we also arguably, um, maybe, I, I think the, the application portability aspect of things is certainly important, but I think it's also important to think about data, and in fact, uh, I, I would probably argue that, that as things become kind of more data-centric uh, and we're dealing with these very large uh, databases, or actually more, more typically very large sets of unstructured data, uh, thinking about how the data relates to portability um, is also important. And then, you know, that's kind of the technical aspect, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But then the other aspect, which sort of gets out of the technology to at least a certain degree, is kind of who owns this data and how can the, you know, what are kind of permissible uses of intersecting the data. Um, Dave McCrory, who's uh, at Warner now, um, I think he's generally credited with uh, coining this term uh, data gravity. And this is a graphic of his uh, kind of trying to sort of uh, quantify what data gravity means. And I'm actually not so concerned with the, you know, kind of with, with the pictorial equation that's up here, but rather uh, really with the basic concept. You know, this idea that if you have a very large amount of data, uh, in an application associated with it, well, maybe you can move the application, but there are a lot of matters of physics, if nothing else, to actually moving that data around. And, you know, there's certainly no, you, you cannot change the laws of physics and all that. So, uh, because there's not always going to be an answer to this. But really, the, my, my point here is that when uh, we are thinking about portability of applications, I think it's going to be increasingly important to think about the portability of the associated data with those applications. And, and in fact, um, um, I was talking to Adrian Cocroft of, of Netflix a couple nights ago, and he actually prefers the term services to applications. And one of the reasons he likes to use the term services there is because it really, he really thinks of a service as the code and its associated data. So you really almost need to think of those as an atomic entity at some level. Um, you know, one of the things, as many of you may have heard, uh, John Mark Walker, um, you know, up at keynoting in the first day, uh, you know, again, can't change the laws of physics, but one of the things to think about is at least from a technical point of view, how do you, uh, how do you create a hybrid storage infrastructure 
that lets you uh, move data across different places. And, you know, and I think well, the, the main point here is the contrast with, say, having a storage array that only runs uh, you know, in one particular data center. You, know, you, you can't bring your custom storage array into a public cloud environment, for example. So I think that's one of the reasons I'm starting to think about these open source, software-only storage infrastructures is that though we still definitely need to worry about latency and bandwidth and all that kind of stuff, that at least gives you a, an infrastructure that is portable uh, subject to whatever constraints you may have in terms of moving large amounts of data. So I mean, I, I certainly don't claim that having uh, very large scale software only storage is the only thing you need to think about in terms of data portability, it absolutely isn't. But I think I would probably argue that starting to think about storage in these terms is sort of a precondition towards having portable data. And, you know, that's kind of the, the kind of the technical aspect of things. Uh, I, think there, I think there's also, we're, we're needing to start to think more about kind of some of the uh, kind of some of the more philosophical or some of the more um, human uh, to use uh, terminology here. Uh, Jer Thorpe, uh, he's at NYU. Uh, I, think he, I think he was I think he was like a residency at Intel when he was saying this. But you know, he's starting to really think about what are some of the kinds of questions that we're going to need to be answering around data. And I think a lot of these are not really well understood at this point. Uh, but, you know, what do, what do kind of do we mean by data ownership? A lot of this is not as well established necessarily. Some of this is in copyright law, but a lot of things are not terribly well established. You know, I mentioned the issue around journals earlier on. Um, you know, and you know, and then, so, but even if you kind of establish ownership of a particular block of data, uh, I think one of the things that we're increasingly going to have to deal with is, you know, what do the intersections of these data mean? Being, you know, what really is is privacy? And I'll show you an example in the next slide. Um, that I, I think is going to be very problematic. I'm, I'm frequently reminded of. Uh, Way back in the dark ages, in the early days of CDs, uh, Lotus had a uh, had a program, uh, uh, well, an offering uh, that they called the Marketplace, which was essentially this uh, bunch of data on, you know, essentially demographic type data uh, by nine digit zip code, which they were going to be selling on some CDs, and there was a massive out you know, uproar about this because, you know, if nine digit, C, nine digit zip codes in some contexts can get very close to being personally identifiable data. And, you know, it seems sort of so quaint by today's standards, but this caused massive outrage that anybody could buy this in the early 90s. And, you know, of course, today there's you know, many more complicated things, you know, you know, like what is anonymized data, for example. Uh, and it turns out that a lot of things that are apparently anonymized turn out, in fact, the anonymization can be broken. So that, that's kind of going to be, uh, so I think that's going to be a big question going forward. This is, this is just sort of one example, not really a personally identifiable uh, way but uh, just an example of some of the kind of almost surprising things that you can do um, when you start mashing all this data together. Um, this, is, uh, this is Flickr. Uh, this is San Francisco. Uh, basically using some algorithms, Eric Fisher, uh, uh, depending upon whether a person had recently taken photos nearby, um, just sort of classified them as either tourists, you know, likely tourists, or likely residents. And the red are likely tourists, and the blue are likely residents. And for any of you who know San Francisco, 
this actually looks pretty on target. Um, and basically, of course, people were, this is with geotagging uh, primarily in people's cell phones who are taking these pictures and uploading them to Flickr. Um, so th this, is, this is just one, I think, particularly colorful example of the kind of things that can be, ter be de determined by piecing the, essentially bringing together different types of information. And in this case, you know, I think this is pretty much a very harmless example, but there are other things that can be done that are you know, perhaps less harmful. You know, as we start talking about tagging people in Facebook and that kind of thing. APIs. Um, this, uh, in a way, I think this is probably going to be one of the, the biggest questions that, from an openness standpoint, we really need to deal with going forward. Because increasingly, uh, APIs are going to be central to app development. Um, now, I, th I think the folks who say, oh, you'll be, be able to develop applications just by Putting a bunch of APIs and pointing and clicking and tying them together. You know, I, I, any of you who are app developers out there, I think your jobs are still very safe. There is uh, there is uh, lots of other things that will need to be done uh, to develop applications. But I think it is also fair to say, um, you know, I did sort of show the graph going up and to the right that there's more and more APIs are going to be out there, and increasingly. Uh, for web type development, you're not going to just uh, develop an application, you know, write a whole bunch of Python code in, in a vacuum and be done with it. In many cases, you're going to consume Maps APIs or other types of APIs that are out there. So, you know, what does open mean in the context of APIs. I think there's a lot of different kind of taxonomies and things you can do about them. This is from uh, Lewis Gray, who has a very popular blog in Silicon Valley. And he sort of breaks the middle three categories. You know, the first one is open access. And this basically means that, you know, at, that you, you, you can use an API, you know, for an API that you can't use is probably not very useful. Uh, but this is an API that the company in question can sort of decide tomorrow that you're a competitor and don't get to use it any longer, or that they're going to change the pricing or the terms of accessing that API. Um, you know, not surprisingly, I, you know, I would argue that you know, that's kind of dangerous to base a business around those APIs. Of course, you know, there are companies that, uh, that you know, basically were building their business and using Twitter APIs, and Twitter said, no, I don't think we're going to let you do that any longer, and goodbye business. Um, there are APIs that leverage open standards of various sorts, and, you know, um, you know, everybody, you, you know, using standards is great. You know, that's sort of like saying, yeah, you know, I'm going to program an API and I'm going to follow best practices by following some of the open standards out there. But that doesn't really say much about the API itself. And then open standard APIs, there's a clear definition to be utilized by multiple providers in an interoperable way. Now, when I say standard, do I mean that some holy standards body has sprinkled holy water on it and said, this is good? I, I, not necessarily, because I, I think that's a recipe for moving very slowly. But uh, I, do think, uh, I do think it means that it's not you know, one company saying, oh, this API is open, but the implementation is really complicated and nobody else actually offers it. Um, you know, this is, um, this is again, another list from John Mooser. Um, I think this is more about, uh, I would argue it's more about what makes it a good API in general than what makes a 
good open API necessarily. Um, you know, and so some of this comes back to come some of the community discussion around open source. You know, it's great to be open, but it also needs to be you know, useful. You know, there needs to be some sort of plan and business model perhaps around this that you know is actually going to exist in six months. Has to be easy to use. This is why REST has become so popular. Um, you know, great support for developers. So uh, yeah, I, I think this is really, in addition to having something that you're in control of, it needs to be something you would actually want to use because just being open doesn't buy you a lot. Uh, you know, obviously uh, there has been some uh, there's been some legal uh, legal cases around APIs in recent years. This is the, the Google Android, uh, which fortunately seems to, for now, have come down largely in Google's favor. Namely, you know, you can't you can't uh, copyright an API. Um, but this is certainly going to be an ongoing legal area that is, I think, a, a lot of concern to a lot of folks going forward. Yeah, these are just some other aspects of APIs, you know, stability. I kind of talked about some of these, but you know, what basically how can you use this and how confident are you that you'll continue to be able to use it on the terms that you started using it? Final area, and you know, this gets me a little further afield is the mobile web. And you know, I suppose the provocative question is, are our app stores evil? So, you know, certainly they've been successful, but are they evil? And are they a passing fad? Uh, HTML5, um, you know, not quite standardized yet, but, you know, essentially it, it is intended to address a lot of the limitations of existing HTML. And, you know, the, the idea here that, um, you know, some would promote is that, once we get to this, you know, HTML5 nirvana, we don't need app stores any longer because HTML5 has some offline capability. And, you know, besides we're, you know, we're reaching, you know, I think Eric Schmidt just said, everybody on the planet is going to be connected to the internet in a few years, decade or so. Um, and so, you know, do we really need this? And, you know, my personal belief is we're going to shift to more of a, of a kind of a web-centric world. There, there are certainly some advantages to doing it. There are certainly openness advantages to doing it. But I, I think there's a lot of reason to believe that we're going to continue to have app stores. Um, certainly a from a monetization point of view, app stores make it a lot easier. Um, there's, there's the distribution infrastructure of the app stores, although arguably someone could build an HTML5 distribution nexus that looked like an app store. Um, and, you know, kind of a lot of, you know, kind of a lot, a number, a number of things that sort of relate to, if you want to sell an application, um, app store is probably going to remain a better way of doing it. And I also suspect that there's still going to remain something of functionality, there's always going to remain something of a functionality gap, uh, although, that could that will arguably narrow. You know, I mean the conundrum here is they're generally walled gardens of some sort, uh, to greater or lesser degrees. Um, there are currently incompatibilities between free software licenses and some of the app stores. Um, Simon Phipps, who many of you may know, uh, actually gave a good talk on the app, app stores in general at Bosdem. Uh, I think Simon's feeling is the 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 licensing compatibility thing is going to be straightened out, and in fact, Microsoft of all people uh, may actually be furthest along with that with their T's and C's. They basically have a term to the effect of, to a degree, free software. You know, our T's and C's um, don't jive with you know, free software license T's and C's. The free software. Uh, the free software license sort of prevails. Um, you know, currently, uh, you know, there's there's 
as far as I know, no way to kind of make a donation to an app in an app store as opposed to having a fixed payment. Um, but I, but you know, I, I think the expect the ex general expectation here, and this was kind of Simon's conclusion as well, is that you're probably kind of sticking your head in the sand if you just you know sort of don't want to deal with this because. It does seem likely to be the predominant way that at least consumer apps are going to be continue to be deployed for, you know, interesting time horizons. Uh, so, you know, questions. Uh, this is again my info, and um, uh, you know, feel free to email me, and um, we have a few minutes for questions. So, questions, anyone? I have some books here to give away. No? Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I think that's very fine. I'm, I'm not sure it, how how new it necessarily is. I could, you know, name at least one very successful open source company, but I won't. That was, uh, I mean, not really in a nefarious way, but was very much, you know, all the developers were there. I, I also say, in all fairness, that I think many open source projects kind of get started by, you know. In no nefarious way, you know, it's just natural. There's a group of people that get started, and maybe, you know, maybe they form some sort of commercial entity around it. But then they they just never expand that community, not because, again, they had anything nefarious in mind, but you know, there was sort of the loss of control. There was the, um, you know, they just didn't invest in it. I mean, you have to invest to make. Community. I mean, I know an open shift at Red Hat, which is our PaaS. You know, we've been you know we just hired a, a a cloud ecosystem evangelist for it. We've been hiring developer evangelists. We put a lot of effort into you know blog posts. Like, I mean, it, it you know, it's, I mean, we're spending real money in order to do that, and and you know, obviously, we think it's the right thing to do. But I think it's very easy for companies again with no nefarious intent. Oh, you know, do, do we hire an evangelist or do we hire another developer? You know, another coder. Oh, well, we we don't have enough coders. We need to hire another coder. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I do have a few books up here. That don't stampede to get up here. And even if I don't have enough, I um, do. Uh, I I will can send electronic copies to people. So. If, Something else comes up, feel free to um, tweet, email, uh, comment on my blog, what have you. So thank you all.